Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for uh, joining us. We're running a couple minutes behind, but uh, a great crowd. Good to see everybody here. I'm Thomas Hare, the Chief Content Officer of the PDMI. Welcome back to our third session of the day. Got a great group for you talking about, obviously, a very hot topic in our space based on all of you sitting out there. So wanted to say thank you to our team for putting the show together. Thank you to the Hard Rock for hosting us. We're thrilled to be here. Thank you all of our sponsors, particularly um, our uh, education sponsor, Pacific Media Technologies. They've got a video to share with you, and here it is. Known for their superior quality and unequaled service, did you know that PMT is also an innovator in technologies that have transformed video ad services? PMT began investing in the latest cloud-based technologies and media tools several years ago with a simple goal in mind, to be recognized as the gold standard in quality and customer care. Today, PMT's services have transformed what brands and agencies have come to expect in video ad management and production services. Fast, highly responsive customer care, and turnaround times with quality guaranteed. Pacific Media Technologies, technology driven, quality guaranteed. Uh, again, thanks to PMT for their support of the education this week. Today's session, how the QR code is changing media attribution. This one's presented by our PDMI Workshop Council, one of our five PDMI councils. Again, if you're a member, want to get involved in what's happening on stage here this week, what's gonna happen on stage in Miami in March, what happens on our webinars, Give us a call, get involved in our councils. That's how you can get how, how you can end up right here where these folks are right now. Without further ado, I'm gonna pass it off to Andy Donato of Extreme Reach, our moderator, who uh, has put together a tremendous group. Thanks, Andy. Thank you. Uh, well, everybody, everybody welcome. I'm so happy uh, that I could be here, and I'm all happy all you were here. Um, first of all, I'd like to introduce everybody on our panel. First, I'd like to introduce David Tiberia who is the VP of Media Analytics at Blue Water Media. I would like to also introduce you to um, one of our great clients here at Extreme Reach, uh, who has been uh, really instrumental, I think, in the, uh, the whole launching of QR codes on TV ads, and that's Jane Pack from Ikigami, um, I'm sorry, from Ikigami Holdings, and also I wanna show a shout out to her partner, Jordan Stanley, right there, who's been very instrumental as well. And then we have these two wonderful people from uh, Flowcode, who is our partner uh, in a lot of these uh, uh, projects that we've done. Um, we have David Schwartzberg, who's the head of sales and strategy at Flowcode. And we have also Megan Glenn, who is the, another head of sales over at Flowcode. So uh, I'd like you to welcome them. Um, so a little bit differently than you do panels and stuff, I figured I would tell a little bit of a story of how I got involved in launching this, and then I'm gonna have David and, and Jane and, and David and Megan you know, talk to you guys and answer questions and stuff like that. So, as you probably know, uh, Matt Edelman and I founded a company many years ago called Treehouse Media Services. We've been in the business since you know, the early 90s in DR, um, and now we've been running uh, Extreme Reach Direct Response maybe for like 11, 12 years. You know, and our big business, obviously, as everybody knows, is you know, making unique content and delivering content to, you know, TV stations all over North America, now all over the world, as well as, you know, CTV ads and stuff like that. Um, so around, I'd say like a year and a half ago, I started getting calls from a couple of clients saying, hey, during the pandemic, saying, Andy, we're seeing QR codes on TV ads again. And I said, well, you know, like five or six years ago, Matt and I worked with some different vendors and stuff, and back then, you couldn't just open up your phone and scan a QR code, you had to have some kind of app. And it was a lot of really like the younger demo um, was scanning QR codes. And we did some tests, we actually did a big test with Proactive and a couple other brands, and it just didn't really resonate into anything. Um, you know, maybe a few scans here and there, maybe a conversion. So we kind of gave up on it. And what happened was, during the pandemic, somebody called us and we started to see some of our clients were using them, like St. Jude. And really on the general side of ER, more or less when I'm talking about companies like, you know, like Just For Men, we saw Subway was testing it. We started seeing people, you know, on linear TV ads were starting to do it. And we said, wow, I mean, maybe this has come to a different way because of the pandemic. So what I did was um, instead of like just throwing up some, you know, some basic, you know, QR code I can make myself on Google, I said, you know, I need to find a partner who can help us in this. And I reached out to the great team at Flowcode 
and we formed a partnership and they have a great product because they can make unique codes with us for each different network so we can figure out the, you know, basically the attribution. And they also have very nice, you know, they have a, uh, you know, they can explain a little bit more, but they have like a, a rounded code that really made it more appetizing to look at on a screen and stuff like that and you could put logos in it and stuff. So we started testing and I said to, you know, David when we were first met, and I said, look, you know, I think the only way this thing could work is if we do it in down and dirty DR. So let's go back to the product guys. Let's see if we can get them to test it. And I did. And we were actually really, really surprised how well it did. I mean, at the minimum, anything we put up there, at least 20% of the site, you know, anywhere between 18 and 22% of the site visitors would scan the code then instead of just searching Google. And some of the results we had were, were pretty good. And since then, I would say we have maybe 120 different tests we did, and we have like 25 active campaigns right now. And we have some very happy customers. We have some customers who are really, you know, deep, reaching deep into a lot of the analytics to see how they can retarget better and stuff like that. So it kind of solved a little bit of a problem because of, you know, everybody's problem in DR was always, oh, has always been attribution of a lot of the web. I mean, we have all these systems and analytics uh, systems for it, but, it was pretty incredible because we, this is pure. It goes right to a, whatever landing page you want it to go to. Plus, you can follow them because if you give us UTMs or MIDs, um, you can figure out where the conversions came from. So it's growing by the minute, and it's doing really well. So I figured I was going to let you guys hear some stories from the people that I've been working with. So I'm going to start with Jane Pack, who is uh, the co-founder and uh, owner of a company that has made a couple of brands that work with us, and one of them has been a fantastic brand. It's done really well. It's probably one of the best campaigns we've worked on called Poof. Um, so Jane, why don't you just tell us, you know, first of all, you and Jordan, when we were first talked, when we first met, and we were gonna, you were, you know, launching this DR campaign, when we brought up the QR code, you guys were like, this is a no-brainer. I don't even, I don't care if you ever tested it before. It can't hurt, why, why not put it in? So since then, every ad that you've run has had it as a third option, mostly, with a phone number, a website, and a QR code code with it. Why don't you just tell the folks a little bit like uh, what your experience was, how well we can, I, I put up a slide and show a little bit of data that she's actually was nice enough to share with us, but why don't you tell us about your experience and how you, in, um, have you engaged it in some of the other campaigns in the future you're thinking of using it? Yeah, so um, it was interesting because when we were launching this campaign, uh, you know, obviously there are a lot of things that we needed to think about before we actually launched, and so when the, uh, when the offer to work with Flow Code came up, it, it was a no-brainer. Jordan and I looked at it and just said, it can't hurt the campaign. Anything that's gonna give us you know, more precise attribution is always good. Um, and we like the idea we're pioneering something new, so why not test it? We had no idea our campaign was gonna be so successful. Right. So that definitely, uh, that definitely helped. But um, you know, we, beyond the, the commercial, we've actually incorporated Flow Code into other things as well, already as well. So we had a spot in Times Square that ran for about four or five months, and we put a QR code on there. You know, everywhere I see an opportunity to put a QR code, I do. We put it on the PDQs for our Walmart, you know, packaging. We put it on the bottles. I put a different code on every um, different kind of SKU. I, you know, we're fully embraced in the QR code uh, to, just to see what, what it's going to tell us. Um, doesn't cost us anything, you know, and I, I even went on the Flow Code website. I don't think you guys even know this. I went on the website, started generating my own codes for other things. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah. You know, when we were looking at PetSmart um, as a potential uh, retail partner, and, um, you know, PetSmart's interesting because they have the majority of their, their buying team is, they're millennials, they're younger. And so it, I actually had a buyer tell me, um, you know, who even watches TV anymore? And I'm like, oh, it's over 100 million people, but it's okay. Uh, <laughs> but I, I realized in that moment that in order to get this buyer engaged, or at least to have a chance, um, I was going to have to do something that she was used to seeing. So in her mind, you know, she's a cord cutter. So in her mind, nobody watches TV anymore. So it was, it was pretty, it was a reasonable assumption to make that QR codes would be something she's already embraced. So we did a little bit of a guerrilla campaign, and we um, we said it. We actually at the PetSmart headquarters. I don't know if anyone's ever been there in, in Scottsdale. They have a big tree, so all the employees walk in the same way, and the tree. Um, and you can obviously bring your pet to work. That tree smells like piss because every dog <laughs> pees on that tree on the way in and out. And, um, it, and that, we've heard other buyers complain about that. So let's go poof this tree. So we went, and I 
hired someone to go like five o'clock in the morning, trespass a little bit, spray down this tree, and then um, we put up a big sign just right next to the tree, said so we poofed it. And we put a big ass QR code that I created a flow code. Um, so they could, you know, every person walking into the building, one saw that there was something weird sitting next to this tree and all the dogs were smelling it, and then they realized that the smell of the urine was gone. Um, and so they were scanning the code and it would take them directly to the commercial. Because what I wanted to be able to do is create buzz inside the building that I can't get into and get the buyers getting, you know, hit from people all over the building saying, what's this poof? What is this? <laughs> um, and she did get bombarded. Uh, you know, she's a tough buyer, so we're, we're still working with her on, on engaging with PetSmart. But you, you, in, in order to actually get in the building, that was the only way because people were scanning that code and they were watching the commercial. It was creating buzz inside the building. So it was, it was our little Trojan horse. So everywhere I see an opportunity to, um, to, to use it, we try it. Um, and it's cool because it, I would see every time somebody scanned it. So I knew the moment, right, because it's a unique code. I knew the moment that people started going to work at PetSmart because that code started, it sends me a message saying, somebody open right. your code, somebody open right. your code. So I could also see how many people were doing it. So it was pretty cool from there. But yeah, we have, we've had some really great um, results. I think we were really surprised to see where the majority of the code scanning was coming from. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, I love that, that direct and clear attribution uh, from the network um, and, uh, and then how many scans, the conversion, I think the conversion's like at 9%, which is great. Right. Um, but you know, that, for me, the big surprise is like BT, like wow, I never would have known that BT was gonna be right. there. So you think about your media buyer looking yeah. at that and saying, hey, even if they didn't convert so many of them, wow, look how many people engaged at BET, so I gotta buy more BET. Mm -hmm. BET. We had one campaign actually that um, they pulled off the, and it wasn't, it had nothing to do with the flow code they told us, they just, the campaign didn't work, but it was a mail product that was almost like a, a version of like a, you know, not a knockoff, but another version of mail, like, like Nugenics, let's just say, and it had, um, had Shaq in it. And it got all these scans and everything, but the most amazing thing was the majority, there was a humongous amount of scans on the Motor Trend channel. Now the Motor Trend channel is like a cheap channel, right, to buy media on. They had all these, so he goes, you know, if anything we learn, we're not running, we're running on Motor Trend Channel for now yeah, on, like 24-7. <laughs> uh, I mean, you know, so um, it's been great. So thank you, Jane, that's fantastic, thank you. So we have David Tiberia here from Blue Water, and one of the funny things is um, I had flown down to visit my very good friend Gina Pomponi down in, my, uh, down in uh, during the holidays, and absolutely, <laughs> there's another icon in this industry. Um, and. You know, she, I went up, the, had, we hung out, and I went to their office, and then she basically said, ah, talk to David. She goes, get out of my office. I have no time for this. <laughs> so I went and I, saw, I spoke to David, and I was kind of relaying to him some of the results we're kind of seeing, and David really engaged it, and he loved it to the point that uh, he started calling me weekly, and we set him up, and he had a, uh, with, with, with a flow code deal, and uh, we started tagging a lot of the spots for you. And if you could, you know, share with us a little bit about some of the insight of what you've seen, and how you feel about it. Yeah, so I think Andy's remembering this with a little bit of rose-colored glasses <laughs> uh, because poor Megan over there had to, when I was, you know, he, he introduced me to Megan and as we talked, um, I have maybe a tendency to be a little skeptical from time to time. But if anybody knows you, they're gonna know. Like, this story <laughs> is so on brand. Yes. Yeah. So long story short, for those of us who've been in the room for an extended period of time, We've seen QR codes before on TV. This is not the first time that this has been, you know, a trend, something that, you know, in an industry, you know, we don't get enough credit in this business for pioneering attribution, right? For pioneering understanding what response is being driven by what are advertising. That's like table stakes now for a lot of brands. That's what they want to do. That's why they lean into digital. But there's a group of people in this room that have been doing that for 30 plus years. So um, we've, so this is not, you know, and, and so when QR codes came around the first time and they were a thing, everyone around DR world thought, hey, this is something that we can use because we've done it with the phones, we're doing it with the web, QR, something that we can lean into. Obviously, it didn't work. So when, you know, a Andy initially mentioned it to me, I was like, forget it, we've done this. This is a waste of time. And, um, 
and I think at some point Gina actually is the one who's like, no, we actually need to test this. So I'm like, no, it's a waste of time. We've been there. Uh, and I was wrong. I was just dead wrong. Um, you know, historically, when we had run QR codes a long time ago, no one scanned. And we, you know, I, I think it is our job to be a little skeptical as an agency to make sure that we're not using our clients as guinea pigs to try things that are going to be detrimental to their business. So I did ask a lot of tough questions. I may have beat up Andy a little bit and Megan a little bit about mm -hmm. it. But in the end, we ended up finding the right client partner. Um, you know, we ended up testing it on television. Uh, and I feel like we tested it the right way, which we'll touch up base on here in a second. But, you know, the, the short story is it worked. Um, we've driven over 110,000 unique scans now across all of our clients in just the last seven months. Um, and that's 110,000. Well, that's not, that's just unique scans, right? There's actually some people that will scan more than one time. They might see a commercial a couple of times, just like someone might call in multiple times. But what for our clients, what that means is it's 110,000 more attribution points that we have to look at, right? It's 110,000 more people that didn't go to Google, right? That weren't, that though for those 110,000 impressions, those people weren't charged click rates from Google PPC, right? That's 110,000 times where Amazon didn't have a shot to pick them off. Walmart didn't have a shot to pick them off. And we know that those guys are, they are our partners, right? We, we need those retailers to help drive product sales but at the same time, it's a challenge to attribute and to understand what your campaign's driving when Amazon's in the mix just siphoning off the top. So it's been a real huge net benefit to our clients. Uh, we've, we've implemented um, one of the cool things about the Flowcode technology you mentioned about being able to put logos. We actually use that logo space to put uh, call to actions in there because we know screen space is really, you know, it's, it's very uh, precious for, for uh, television. So we've, we've actually incorporated those right into the code, which is something we wouldn't be able to do with other providers. Um, and then additionally, you know, we get really great analytics. We get feeds and um, reports from you guys. We've built back-end flows on our team that, uh, that so we know station, length, creative. Uh, we're able to then tie that into the system. It pulls back into our media reporting. And just like a phone number, we're able to sit there and show very clearly you ran this spot, this is the response that came through on QR. And just like Andy said, you know, I've, we've got a major lead gen campaign right now that's running. Uh, it, we have more scans than we have phone calls. Uh, now the phones are still valuable. We're not abandoning those in any capacity. Uh, but we do have more scans and phone calls at this point. And it accounts for 30, almost 30% of our total web traffic volume at this point. People scan at that level. And in our experience, because you know, we are we, we are direct marketers, the understanding what the impact of a new response mechanism in the mix had. We A-B tested our, our main clients with and without head to head. So we knew that um, if there was a damaging result to adding the QR code, because you know, we tested text messages before and, and it works for some clients. Uh, but in our experience, you really couldn't have text and phone and a website. It tended to they tended to sort of like damage each other at some point and a response went down. We don't know why, we kind of had a guess that maybe you know, that's because consumers just didn't know exactly what to do with too many options. Uh, but when we head to head tested this and we looked at, but with campaigns that were mature, that had um, you know, response rates that were measurable and we had patterns that we could look at, we didn't see a, de a degradation in the overall response. We saw it mostly as, as additive. So yeah. it's been really great. Yeah, great. You know. uh, it's, it's been a big, uh, you know, excellent experience for us. So, David and Megan, um, why don't you tell everybody a little bit about, you know, this great partnership, first of all, that Extreme Reach made with Flowcode, because uh, they were, um, they were they obviously are in the linear business, more in sports and stuff like that, but really weren't pushing that much in, in, in ad, ads, especially not in DRTV. Um, but tell us a little bit about that, and tell us a little bit about some of the other customers and some of the other categories that you people are using it um, and some of the experiences as it every day we see that it grows. I tell a story like Tim Armstrong is the CEO um, of Flowcode. He used to run AOL. He's kind of a famous guy and we've had him in our office and we went to an event last week and he grabbed me on the side. He said, Andy, I wake up every morning. I'm seeing all these ads. This is great. Now we got to get all the general advertisers to do this. They, they would be crazy if they didn't. So do me a favor. Tell us a little bit about you know your company 
and about some of the experiences that you've seen and um, some other things you could share with everybody. Uh, I'm happy to hit the uh, general flow code side and then I'll flip over to you on the, the verticals and where the growth is. But, um, you know, when we started the company almost four years ago, every conversation started with, do people know how to scan? Do they understand that iPhones and Androids can now read without an app? And all of the friction points that had existed for the 10 years when, when codes had existed but hadn't been used uh, efficiently on screens. And I think what happened during COVID was the educational aspect got sped up a decade. And it happened on the consumer side very quickly, really driven by the restaurants, COVID check-in forms, things that were habitual to everyone of every age and every demographic. And then very quickly, I think it flipped over to, okay, folks started innovating on the other side, which is, okay, how do we integrate this? How do we get this into creatives? And I think that's where the market has gone since, which is now the supply side and the, in, the companies and innovators are, are now starting to say, okay, this is now mainstream. The genie doesn't go back in the bottle. And that's when we, we start to see kind of the significant growth shifting towards linear. And I think uh, the world, you know, everyone in the world kind of falls in the bucket of you know, people who want to measure and people who want to just call it brand advertising to avoid having to measure it. Right, and right. when we started working with you guys, uh, we, we found that uh, the ER team in particular was meticulous about deploying it the right way, leveraging the technology, and ha had brought forward clients to say, hey, put this in a test and let the data speak for itself. Right, right. And I think, uh, I think when, when Megan came on and joined and brought a perspective from the market of how codes worked in the space, it also, I think, elevated us. But Megan, do you want to just talk about what you've seen yeah. since uh, having been a cl on the client yeah, side? Yeah, she was on the client side, That's right? about the worst kept secret, and maybe it's, it's not a secret at all, but I'm probably the most biased flow coder because I was on the client side first. And the first activation that I did, I was at WGN TV in Chicago. I was the digital manager, and I was like, guys, what if we put codes on TV and made it clickable? And the news department, of course, was like, I don't know about that. I'm not sure about that. And we were like, let's just see, let's just see. So the first activation we did was a 60-second uh, live read, and it was for a, like a topical nerve pain cream, right? It got 56 scans. I lost my mind because that was 56 individual users that I got to go back to that client and be like, guys, look at this. There were 56 people who actively wanted to engage with you. And that was... During COVID, we put a code up. It was very kind of like tiny in the corner and all of this. And then when we started realizing, I'm looking at Google Analytics for TV viewers. I'm looking at data and conversion for TV viewers. How do we rinse and repeat? And that just is kind of where it, it took off. And I mean, fast forward nine months, I want to say, and I came over to the Flow Code team. And, and what we've seen is, is Point blank, you put a code up there with a call to action, people are going to scan it. That's, that's just the, the simple thing. There are a lot of best practices that go into it. We could talk all day about how long your code should be on screen and what that call to action should be. But the long and short of it, it's that same kind of advertising practice of tell people what you want them to do. What is the value exchange? What is that action? Um, and Flow Code just really kind of shortened the distance between people seeing and, and having that resonance, that resonant moment with the, the creative messaging and actually choosing to take an action on it. And so um, that kind of is the, the first thing to say is that vertical, I feel like, could be a little bit secondary because there's always a consumer that's willing to interact or buy that product and flow code is going to capture that user. Now, um, in terms of like, where have we seen things that were like astronomical? Obviously, uh, direct response has been really incredible because it's everything from jacuzzi tubs to pet sprays, and it's, it's conversion rates that consistently stay 15%, 25% up, upwards. You know, we've seen 100% conversion rates on CRM capture campaigns, which is like mind blowing. Um, so that's kind of the thing is like, it doesn't, like the price tag on that doesn't matter too much. But we've also seen some really interesting other activations and things like charitable giving, you know, scan to donate, um, scan to register to vote, scan to get involved. All of these kind of topically relevant direct connections, even if it's not a purchase action, there's still a conversion that can be found there. And because it's such an easy conduit to, to that engagement, 
uh, it, people will, will genuinely respond. We also see a lot of really interesting ha things happening in um, like legal. One of my favorite ones is scan to find out if you have a case. Yep, That's yep. one that we hear a lot. Yeah, we just actually, we just launched them where we're actually, you know, like obviously if you're in legal, you want them to just, you want to talk to them on the phone. Mm -hmm. You don't want to go to a website, but what they did was we have had a couple of customers who've tested and it's worked, where they go to a landing page where they have an option to do a form fill, and they have an option to press a button and call the number, and we've had some really good results in the in the law space, and believe it or not, we're testing right now in the uh, Medicare Advantage space, mm -hmm. and believe it or not, we are getting some some good news on it. So it's very interesting, and it's that is total older demo. I mean, you know, that's sixty five and older. I think that's probably the biggest thing was even on the client side, like as of, oh, I keep hitting my mic, sorry. As the, as the client, I was like, oh, is this only going to work for people who are 20 to 35, right? Oh, that was kind right. of exactly what I expected. That's what this proved, yeah. But this, I mean, I can honestly, like hand to God, say that our strongest conversion rates and some of the most engaged with campaigns are demographics that are 55 plus. Right, and then another thing I can mention uh, that was very interesting, which I find mind boggling, so believe it or not, I added up uh, like five or six major campaigns, like Jane's and some others, and I went through all the scans, all the stations, and then I actually got some of the actual air times, and I sat there for like a whole weekend, put together this whole chart. My wife thought I was out of my mind. <laughs> but I was out of my mind by Sunday night. Uh, there, are tools, but, there are tools that will do that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But of course, I'm old, and I just try to do it manually myself, and I didn't call you like I should have. But. Um, anyway, but what, we, what I figured out was on all these campaigns, 15% of all the scans came after the airing. Actually, way after the airing in some cases. And you know why? People DVR programming, older people, and after like a minute, they watch it like it's live. They don't, they don't remember that they're watching a DVR program. <laughs> so we had one campaign that was a holiday campaign that had like, they ran for like a week and a half. He had like 5,000, 4,000 scans. He was happy, but uh, Christmas Day, office over. From cr the 26th to January 15th, he had 86 scans and eight conversions. And when I looked at all the stations, MeTV, Decades, Lifetime Movie Network, um, Inspirational <laughs> Network, it's like, it's like free money. I mean, why wouldn't you love this, right? Why wouldn't you? Yeah. I mean, from a length side, too, it's because you'd mentioned about all the different types of campaigns that you run on. We've even put it on, like, very short length drive to retail campaigns yeah. Yeah. that didn't really even have a specific call to action. Um, it, I mean, there was a call to action, it was very generic. Uh, and people scanned on drive to retail campaign. So we were, I mean, there's. You put phone numbers on a 30 second spot, no one calls. Like it, you, know, you guys know that. It's tough to drive a call on a 30 second. It's just so, so short, it's so fast, it happens so quickly that consumers, they don't have time to write down the phone number, they don't have time to respond. Uh, same thing with, uh, with anything drive to retail. Like generally, if you're, if, you're, if you're pushing retail or you're not really, you maybe have a URL on there, people just don't tend to go because there's not an offer, you're not asking them to buy. People were scanning the code. I don't know if they thought maybe that there was a special offer, there was something there, but we were able to advise our client on how to optimize a drive to retail campaign with hard numbers, right? Like hard, attributable, we ran this here, we ran this creative, uh, and we made optimizations to it, improve their campaign, you know, improve their retail results being because we had this new response option. Right, one other story I can tell, I got so many stories, but Matt, no, this is one of Matt's favorites. Um, he has a client he's been working with that is new to the DR space, and he, they, um, they made a big deal at Walmart. So let's say they were at, I don't know, 100 stores or whatever. They had an ad uh, that we ran. Um, it was really just drive, drive to web. And basically, they added the QR codes, and they made a deal with Walmart, where it went to the Walmart page for the product, mm -hmm. similar to something you've done in the past. Mm -hmm. And the, they had all these scans. Then you know Walmart didn't share with the, uh, any info as far as conversions and stuff. They were so happy with it because there's so many people landed on the site, maybe it bought the product. If not, they landed on the site, maybe it bought something else. Yep. They were so happy with it, they put it in another couple hundred stores, yep. the product. So, and I would assume that maybe, hopefully, the client didn't have to spend as much on the media because he threw that in yep. as an option. So it, it's definitely, you know, there's so many different things you can do with it. Um, we've done testing in a, where we've drive to the app store um, with some products. We did a lottery campaign. It did very well. Um, we're working on a couple right now. 
um, actually on TV right now, if you can see it, even though we're not doing it at the moment, um, the Home Depot is doing something like that, where they're actually you know, scanned to go to the App Store. So there's so many different areas you can use it. One other, a uh, couple other items I, I want to throw in is that I really think that this could be utilized big time in performance media. Now we all know all the performance media stuff, the deals you guys all make together, and we, you all worked with each other, because I know. Um, <laughs> but you know, think about it, one of the biggest problems has always been on performance media, um, you, know, you always have to have something that has like a phone number, so they could really show you how many calls and conversions. If you just have a website in, you, there's no way for a, for a true you know, conversion that you know what happens. Well, now let's say you have a campaign that has a phone number and a QR code, Maybe these performance marketers now or these could then go and say, look, that was a campaign I couldn't do before, but maybe now I can. Or maybe I could just do a QR code, right? Yep. Or you look at it, look at all these big brands in the world. Maybe now on the performance side, you guys can all go and meet with some of these big companies and say, hey, we have all this performance media. Just put a QR code on there and pay me per scan and conversion, you know? Yep. So there's a lot of different options we see what's happening, which is, this is just going to keep growing. Yeah, we also, I think we saw the, um, a lot of the direct consumer brands had been so trained from Google and Facebook to see real-time analytics, real-time data, uh, that they're almost used to getting a dopamine hit when they start running media. And I think when they go back, and at some point they hit a ceiling in those digital channels, and all of them want to find efficient reach. And undeniably, every one of the brands we worked with find their way to linear or broadcast or connected or, and they're using it to tap a new audience, but also just get a ton of scale tremendously fast. And then they're able to then try to trigger that similar dopamine hit of, okay, well, what's working, not working. Can I shift this budget accordingly? And you could see different examples of how they deploy that. And again, they also deploy it horizontally, which is being able to integrate that into their out of home, their print, their, their linear spots. And, ultimately have a single source of truth. Yeah. Well, and that's, that's exactly it. I mean, it's a, it's a conversion tool that turns every impression into performance media, and it's the only attribution tool that's truly omnichannel, right? So you could build that, that flow code, implement it across every aspect of somebody's campaign, and, and realistically understand how a consumer is, is navigating through all of those impressions. And the thing you hear us say all the time, you can't accidentally scan a flow code. So like it's super intentional, right? And and even if, you know, we could talk about these omnichannel activations and how, you know, CTV tends to drive a lower scan count than live TV does or like broadcaster, you know, there's a lot of kind of variables that go in there, but the thing that's always true is that you can accidentally scan a flow code and that is your most sit forward audience. They have seen the message, they're choosing to respond to it and what can you learn about that user? Whether it's their physical location, whether it's the types of content that they're choosing to interact with and optimizing your campaign around it. I mean, ultimately that's kind of the unsung hero of the entire equation. The conversion rates are amazing, but when it comes to being able to more easily find those users, I think that's ultimately where it comes from. It's a bit more akin to like, it's kind of like the digital phone number, right? We'll call it the digital phone number. Cause I mean, you, there were, there are other omni-channel things, like if you can put a phone number. I don't wanna it, hear I, it. I hear you, I'm just reminding you, there are other omni-channel options out I don't, there. I don't know what you're talking but, about. But the truth is though, we do see, it's, it, it's very much more akin to the phone number where you get that very direct correlation. You, do, you are able to understand and use that in other places. You can, you can use it on other mediums. You can put it on your product box, right? You can use it to, you know, Get all the buyers at at PetSmart to sure. like, what are these people doing to me? Yeah. Uh, but but it's much more akin to the phone number in that. Yeah, and regard. there's all these different ideas that are out there. One of the great things about the whole flow code system is that, like we would make create these ads, send them all out to these stations. They run for a while, and Jane could call me tomorrow and say, you know what, I'm on like 50 stations right now. You know what, just switch the links now. Just drive them all to we'll, we'll drive them all to Amazon, and I could do that in a matter of seconds. Yeah, yeah. basically. I'm glad you brought that up because. Well, this is all going on. I've, the most interesting thing that's happened to us um, as far as attribution is, and I think this has happened to all DR campaigns, is the amount of um, sales that is being dominated by Amazon. Um, so Amazon has been on, you know, on our end tag for a long time. And um, so we launched Poof in November of last year, so we're almost a year old. 
and then we opened our Amazon store in March of this year. So it's been six months. Um, Amazon has exceeded the total amount of revenue and orders that um, our website has in half the time. And you know, so when we started, it was like 35% of our orders were coming from Amazon. I'm like, okay, that's that's manageable. And then the next week it was 38. Then the next week it was 40. The next week it was 45. We're, we've gotten up to 72% of our total orders in a week coming from Amazon. And I don't have a QR code. And of course, I have zero idea what the hell is happening when people get to Amazon. I have an idea in my mind, but I have no way of, of attributing where what's no happening. UTMs, it's nothing. No, nothing. So. Yeah. What was interesting to me that we actually haven't finished this conversation that I want to finish is um, can we take you know, even a period of time, because I really want to understand, um, because Amazon is just, it's, it's dominating. You know, If you're a Prime member and you see something you want to buy on Instagram, Facebook, TV, you name it, on a billboard, yeah. first thing you're going to do is Amazon. My product search first spot is Amazon because I'm addicted to Prime. And that's statistically, we know that. Right? Yeah. There's research out there that says that's, that's happening happen. like 65% of the time now is the number, 55, it's in that range. Now it's, for, in my life it's about 70%. There you go. So, so 70% of my orders, I have no idea about the journey until they actually purchase. That's a problem. That's a real problem for us. So we can, you know, we can extrapolate from the actual TV side on, on the dot com and see, okay, you know, this many orders are coming from this network and such and so on, but that's, that's, that subset is not enough accuracy for me to really understand how can we be working with Amazon differently, because Amazon's not going away. And so the conversation I wanted to finish that we started in one of our calls was um, you know, around creating a QR code, establishing a period of time, and just driving that to Amazon, because I just want to see what happens and what it tells us. Right. Any more data is always better. Yeah, I mean, it's very easy. We could switch it on for two days and switch it back. Right. It takes takes us like minutes, and it's, you know, as long as you're not changing the creative that's in the spot, you don't have to reship it. Right. So nobody can break my chop saying, Andy, I don't want another bill from you. <laughs> oh, we're doing all this tagging. Well, you know, all, uh, you know, uh, but you know, like I said, you know, we, we, it's very simple to do, and yeah. and we're happy because we want our clients to pre keep performing better with it. Um, I don't know, um, I guess, would we want to answer some questions maybe, or take any questions if anybody has anything to any of us? Um, right here. Hello. Let's start with uh, right Tom, here. you want to give it up? Okay. Hi, um, I'm an um, adoptee, and we have a client that has been using, in our short form TV, QR codes for a couple of years now. Okay. And my question is, I think Megan said um, omni-channel, but it doesn't work well, I'm dropping my, on mobile. Right? How do you predict, or do you think that there is going to be a way? I've heard that there is a way, and I've tried it, and I yes. can't make it work. Yes. This so is help a, me with that. Yeah. So there's a. This is a, a little known fact. You can actually currently, right now, today, interact with a QR code on your phone. It is the clunkiest experience ever. Uh, you could take a screenshot open it up in your photos, press and hold, and it'll go through like a scan. Um, operates just like a link click. Is that just Apple, not Android? I'm not positive about Android. I'm, I want to say it's, it's similar. I'm an Apple user myself, so I'm the worst about that. I don't know. Um, but the thing that I would say is that it is teased. We've been hearing um, a little bit about iOS updates, upcoming iOS updates that will actually allow you to, for example, watch a video that has a QR in it, tap the QR, and actually like go through the, the no pun intended, go through the flow like, it, like it, it's normal. So you're absolutely right. It is a little bit like mobile is obviously not designed to be a QR environment. Um, I do expect that to change. And the other thing that I'll say is that having a flow code in video that serves on mobile is not going to hurt you. Um, the thing that I do feel is that it actually can drive up click-through rates, and then I also have seen, um, you know, if it's video that's running on, on, you know, a larger format screen as well, scan rates can be a little bit higher too. I think it has a lot to do with the recognition of the technology anyway. Yeah, so. one other point I can make, uh, I live in a home, uh, first of all, we've done some CTV testing and it's been, yeah, it's okay, but nothing nearly as well as linear. I mean, not even close. And one of the reasons I feel it is, is DTM told me this, that I think it's 42% of all people who watch programs on 
you know, like apps, like let's say Paramount or something like that, are watching them on a television. The rest of them are watching them on either a phone or an iPad, because I live with my wife and my daughter, and my wife watches TV exclusively on this little iPad. We have a 75 inch and an 85 inch TV, theater TVs in our house, and I'm the one sitting there watching that. And my daughter, all she does is watch TV on her phone. Mm -hmm. You know, so, you know, sooner or later that's gonna hopefully change, but. Um, Yeah. yeah. Your kid is watching on this and it's very casual and you and I tape it forty nine ninety five on our TV and we're a different caliber of audience. Yeah. And we and also just on best practices, anybody wants to ask us after the show, you know, we have working together, we know all the best practices, like basically the QR codes in a certain size. For the average TV in the United States now is forty two inches. Six feet away you shouldn't have to zoom in at a certain size. Um, so we've learned a lot of that placement and everything. So anybody has questions with that, we can help. I forget who mentioned it, but you talked about knowing unique scans versus total scans. Yep. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming that's like device ID or some kind of profile that comes through that you can understand of what's been the total versus like the actual unique versus people who have maybe scanned it more than once. Yep. Which maybe they're interested even more than the other people who scanned it one time. So. Is there any retargeting capabilities you guys have to go find those devices again in other places? And Megan's smiling over there very happily. <laughs> <laughs> Glad I asked that question, then, because it leads to her next. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> go for it, Megan. Go, uh, go get them, Megan. Did you, did, you, did, did you plant that? <laughs> oh, that's no, that's making sure. I'll, it's I'll, I'll, your money's coming later. Don't worry about it. Um, no, OK, so the, the really fun thing about, um, so we flow code our, ourselves we essentially uh, on the scan don't see any personally identifiable information so i actually don't see device id i do see ip address which when it's in home media is pretty valuable but qr is qr it's not foolproof um so what's really interesting um, about the retargeting capability when you really want to capture that audience we have a secondary piece of our platform that's called flow page and essentially, uh, flow page is a landing page that can only be accessed by that flow code scan. So think of it as a landing page for your TV campaign. That flow page, you can house a ton of secondary actions in there. It could be anything from tap to call, tap to text, enter your CRM info, e-commerce, whatever. We have people that do Snapchat filters and AR and VR, like whatever surprise and delight moment you want to be there, you can have it there. And what's more valuable about that is the fact that A, you can break down all of that secondary reporting and say, this is how my audience wanted to interact with me at this captive moment of interest. But then also, I can put a retargeting pixel in there and effectively retarget my most key TV audiences based on how you're splitting out those codes, right? You're A-B testing creative, you're, te you're targeting four different audiences or four different channels. You can really silo down that, that retargeting just by using the flow page. And otherwise, I mean, you could always drop in a retargeting pixel on whatever landing page you're using if it's not flow page. But flow page keeps it really accurate and kind of keyed, so. I mean, there, there are some kind of like, there's a lot of data there, right? And we've looked at it, um, you know, there's, in a world where building first party audiences is becoming more valuable because of the death of the third party you know, tracking, we know that Google is continually, it, it, they are on the cusp a lot of times of taking that away, right? They've, they've been there multiple times, they've walked it back, but we know it's gonna happen. Um, and, and I personally, we're getting into my brain now, but I personally think it's only gonna be a matter of time until it's regulated, right? Like, it is not likely that you know, the types of regulations that exist in the state we're sitting in, in terms of consumer privacy online, what you can and can't track, that is likely to, to go national eventually. I don't think, it's only gonna be a matter of time until it happens, right? Maybe two years, maybe five years, maybe 10 years, but it's gonna happen. Um, the amount of information that you can get from the scans in terms of, you know, device types, um, you know, whether or not you consider IP address PII or not, you know, there's some, some talk about that. Some people have different opinions, but you know, even if we ignore that, we understand look, geolocation. We understand, we understand what uh, device they're using. We understand what browser they're using. We under, understand uh, sc uh, screen port size. 
those are details that you know as our, our agency we can leverage to understand and further you know other attribution points about you know purchases or other behaviors on the website as people start to dig in and we start to follow maybe where people have visited they landed on this page did they buy something else did they look at other areas of the website was there something along that path to conversion that is something that we can exploit creatively on the TV commercial or modify our landing pages in order to you know get that conversion to happen quicker so the, the data that's there is very useful in helping to build you know to really build audiences and first party audiences that you can retarget and that you can go after um, that that is far more difficult to do with just a general URL landing page experience because we know they're from TV. Like we know That's they're it. from TV, you know right? Exactly so we know, so from. therefore we know the offer they saw, right? We know the station they came from. Uh, we, you know, we know whether or not they ultimately closed. If someone's generally searching for your, for your website we, or, and shows up through a Google search, it shows up as organic, we can all, we all have attribution tools and we can help to understand which, you know, which is which and those work really well. Uh, but this is, there, there's a lot of information you can uncover here. And a little spoiler alert, we're getting ready to roll out our conversion pixel. And so pretty soon what you'll be able to see is when a user responds to a QR that's in a TV commercial, a flow code, I should just say flow code, responds to a flow code that's in a TV commercial, you'll now be able to tell when they've actually gone to a website and taken an action. Right now we're tracking, well, we're getting ready to track just within the same session, but pretty soon it'll be 30, 60, 90 day look back to understand like how did, how did this user respond to this TV creative? Was it an immediate purchase? Was it later? Um, and, and how do we, how do we optimize toward more of that? So lots of it, lots of our platform is designed based on the needs of the people in this room, really, of kind of what you're trying to prove. And Web developers across the country just collectively decide that they get to install yet another pixel 100%, on your website. 100%, yep. <laughs> Add another one. <laughs> <laughs> It's a, uh, what the answer is, the most sophisticated partners we have typically started with a one-to-one -one relationship where they took a code and they sent it to a single um, destination, right? It was a point A to point B. And over time, what we found was partners were like, well, we'd love to learn where the consumer wants to go rather than imposing a destination. Consumer choice. Right. Yeah. So what they started doing was leveraging the flow page and saying, you know what, I'd love for them to go to right to the checkout. And it'd be ideal for our business, but humans want to price shop, or they want to do go to social to do social proofing. They want to read reviews. They want to find other product. They want to compare. So what we started doing was aggregating those on, on that secondary mobile experience, and that also forced companies, businesses, agencies, partners to create a mobile optimized experience after the scan, mm -hmm. rather than sending to a generic desktop website, and. It was better for them because the conversions got better, but most importantly got better for the consumers in as, as that kind of feeds itself yeah. in more of a flywheel impact. That's what drives scan rates higher. And over the last year to two years, I think what we were seeing every nine to 10 months, we're now seeing every 24 hours in terms of just pure volume. Yeah. And so for us, you know, the, 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 the pressure on people to create better experiences that I think kind of mutually beneficial everyone in the ecosystem. Yeah, this is about consumer experience, right? Like consumer preference. We talk about that with our advertisers all times, like consumers are going to buy where they want to buy. They're going to shop where they want to shop. They're going to do the types of behaviors that they've been trained to do and that we, that, but also that they want to do. And that's what one of those things that it does give us the power to do is now, now there's another choice for consumers. We're not saying you have to call or you have to go to the website. You're saying now you can also scan. Um, and since that behavior, that consumer behavior has now been learned through the pandemic, um, we know that people are, are, are leveraging that. And, and consumer choice is good for us in the end. If we can still measure it and we can give consumers choices, we're probably gonna get better response rates. Power to the people. And honestly, it comes down to like having that, that experience, getting the hooks in and, and all of this. I, uh, we could talk about post-scan experience as a whole other panel because I think that's a huge part of it. But what I love is what David just said. It's, it's about letting the consumer choose whether or not it's branding. Let the consumer choose whether or not it's performance media. Yeah. All right, here she comes. <laughs> I did not plant this either, just so yeah. we're on the same page. Yeah, so I gotta yeah, get out yeah. in front so of that right I now. Yeah, yeah. I probably don't need it. So I have the most random question. And I saw a stat up there that said, um, you guys want me to use this? Yeah. Uh, 
a stat that said flow code is 60% stronger than QR. And I have a client who shall remain nameless, but they were insistent upon using square codes mm. because mm -hmm. that's what you see everywhere you go. You see a square code. Mm -hmm. um, and I know Andy's Man, like, oh, ugly. you know, it's, it's easier to scan. It has to do with it. And I'm like, I get all that. But is it really? When yeah. I see something like performance is 60% stronger, that tells me that it's been tested to some level yeah. of statistical validity. Is that, yeah. is that something I can toss back at him? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> please, please. So we ran probably the single largest test across 75 to 100 brands simultaneously isolating specific variables. Okay. What we're finding and what we continue to see is when folks are using a basic unbranded code of which there's no call to action, people are less inclined, brands, advertisers, to in truly integrate it with a voiceover call to action. Uh, and what we started to do was say, okay, well, when you can brand it and aesthetically integrate it into the spot, and we can make it larger, and we can bring it into the fold. What does that drive in terms of scan rates, conversion rates? And we've seen it anywhere be from 15 to 20%, where we've just isolated the code alone with a call to action, to people who have then truly integrated it with a voiceover, made it native to the creative, where we've seen two to three X lift. And it, 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 it's, again, so part of it is, when we're working with folks implementing flow codes, they're working with the managed service and the best practices. How should I implement it? How do I use it? Where should I run it? How long is it on the screen? So it's not in isolation, which is if you change the colors, you, magically the performance gets better. It's as with everything, all the context that goes into making sure it's done. It's, right. And that's we've where- tested, We've tested it and we don't see much of a difference at all. We have one client who insists that it does better, but right, we have one that insists but we didn't do an A-B test on yours, honestly, but, um, but then we have a, a couple of others where we did it, know, and it didn't make a difference. I think that that's like the big, the big takeaway. So um, we did some, some viewer testing, right? And we asked like, well, how do you feel about, like QR in general, and the general response was, I like that the brand is making it easier for me to interact. And the flow code specifically was, this feels very intentional. Like this feels very much like the brand is paying attention to it. And the other side of it, there's been a lot of bad press around QR for the last year. The FBI said don't scan codes if you don't know where they go. And the thing is you can't always safely scan a QR, but you can always safely scan a flow code. That's, the, that's like a really big takeaway. And at this point, when we look at the way ad creative is performing one to the other, the way consumers are interacting with QR across the board, I think we're getting to a point, based on the, the partnerships that we have, the, the visibility that we have, people see flow codes and, and immediately are kind of drawn to the idea of, oh, there's more to this than just the QR that I got used to at a, at a restaurant. You don't think that's because it's on television and the credibility that that brings? I think that has a lot to do with it. Well, so the round is really interesting. No, these are great questions because. Because I have a client that's insistent, and I'm like. You know, yeah, I know who he is. Yeah. <laughs> Show yourself. Name drop. So he's not here. Let's work on him. Uh, <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, those are, I mean, 100% you make very valid, I mean, those are very valid questions. We also have square flow codes. We yeah. make square flow codes. Yeah. But I'll tell you, in the campaigns that I've run, the round ones have done better. That's what yeah. I Mm -hmm. to say that right, it right. He didn't. But he didn't like. The, I made one that was kind of the color of the product, and he thought it was looked like a tennis ball. Yeah. And he yelled at me, <laughs> and I was like, "All right, I'll make it plain. I don't care." Hey, listen. We have people. The great thing about these guys is we could do square, we can do round, and they've done some shapes. I'll tell you a story real quick. Bissell, Kathy Bissell called her, called me, you know, and and uh, said, "Hey, I want to do this QR code test. I don't want to do it on CTV." And she drove me crazy for a month making a heart because she has the pets and all this other yep. stuff yeah. so yep. we finally got this thing and they test it because what happens is they have to test it a certain amount of times to make sure it works on, on like all these different devices so it takes time to do it I finally did it and she never did the campaign <laughs> <laughs> right 
I mean, we could. We could do different, you know, that's great. See, all these ideas, all the people in the DR space would think about doing this stuff, right? That's what I'm saying. I'm, I'm willing to work with anybody. I do it every day, coming up with some of these concepts. And the flow code guys, but, same thing. But back to it, there's DR, we call them DR best practices at Blue Water, right? But the idea is the best practices still apply. Yeah. Have a call to action. Tag it verbally if you can, right? Get it in early, you know, as early as possible as you can in the spot that's reasonable. You have to do all these things. Throwing the code up there isn't some kind of a magic wand. It's like, right. oh, okay. yeah. right? You, you yeah. still have to be smart about it. You have to be a smart marketer. You have to do the things that give consumers the time to respond, give them the impetus to respond, and you're asking them to actually do it. One other thing real quick, because I know we're running out of time, right? Uh, real Real quick, um, one other thing that we, when we first started together, a great story, and um, the Flow Code guys told me the story that uh, there was a preseason game in Buffalo um, with the Buffalo Bills, and it was the last preseason game. It's running locally and probably streamed, right? And they had this offer: is like scan this code, Bills Mafia, scan this code, and get season tickets and enter to win a free Josh Allen signed jersey. Bills fans are totally like, they're, all, they're totally level. normal. So fifty something. <laughs> 51,000 people scanned the code and gave them their email address. Name, phone number, email. Name, phone number, email. They gave away one jersey and they had 51,000 people who actually they had names. And so yeah, when you think about the unit economics and the ROI of taking 25 seconds of owned and operated inventory that probably cost nothing. And to put a, a code that was pretty modest mm -hmm. and to collect more CRM and first party data that was in their ecosystem that wasn't disrupted by Amazon or Google or Facebook. And they captured that, what was the equivalent of the entire sold out arena or, or even in excess of that. Yeah. And I think, you know, again, it's kind of those tidbits that then people kind of wake up and I think the Super Bowl was another moment like that where 20 million Americans scanned a code that had no call to action, no privacy, no, yeah. They didn't know what they were doing, and 20 million people figured out how to do it. Yeah, and if he would have just kept it static for 30 more seconds, he would have got another 20 million. Right. Oh, yeah. And if they had worked with Flowpage, right? Exactly. We, crashed, you called so. me that Saturday, looking uh, what's going on. Right. I told you. I, um, but you know, like stuff like that. Any way you can incentivize somebody, even if it's not even like thinking they're getting a better deal on a QR code, you're going to get double the amount of scans. Yeah. Cool. That's what we learned. Very cool. Thank you very much, guys. Have a big round of applause for this group. By my count, that's 51,000 folding tables that got crushed in the parking lot at the next Bills home game. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, again, thank you to, to this great group. We'll be back here at 2.30 with our U.S. Hispanic Council talking about the challenges of Hispanic attribution. We'll see you then. Thank you. Bye-bye.